Hi folks, I prepared this little uh, supplemental presentation here to review some of the basics about statistics. I hope you find this helpful. I'm going to relate this to the Wells and Coppersmith data, um, not the specific data, but we're going, uh, you're probably going to find this useful for the homework assignment where we deal with Wells and Coppersmith. So I'm going to try to explain it uh, in terms of surface rupture length of an earthquake or a fault and the corresponding magnitude. So um, let's just jump right in and review a couple of things. Um, so if I sketch uh, some axes here, and I have on my x-axis surface rupture length of a fault, and I have moment magnitude of the corresponding earthquake. And let's say I go out and I collect a whole bunch of data. Um, lots and lots and lots of data. So each earthquake that I collect produces a point on this plot. And what we tend to see if we plot the data is we see a linear trend. Now that's a pretty good trend. Chances are that it's going to look maybe more like this if it was a linear relationship. Putting my points, putting my points, putting my points. Okay, so you get the idea of what we're doing, right? So we can definitely see that there's going to be some sort of relationship there. And any good engineer is going to come along and say, well, let's go ahead and uh, we're going to fit uh, a relationship to this. And so we might run a statistical analysis and find a best fit line that goes through all that data. And we can say, there's our prediction relationship. You know, this is the... Uh, uh, this line here is going to be our uh, magnitude equals A plus you know, uh, B times um, like the log of SRL or something like that. Something similar to what we see with the Wells and Coppersmith. So where B is going to be the slope of our line and A is going to be the y-intercept. And now we have something that we can predict with. Now, 95% of engineers just take this equation, the equation of that line, and they run with it. But here's the problem. If you look at how much of the data actually falls right on the line, it's, it's quite, it's, it's a, just a little bit of data. The majority of the data is scattered about the line. And so say that for a particular side of interest, of um, say SRL star, maybe this is a site we're analyzing. If we were to come up at that particular surface uh, rupture length for this fault that we're, we're analyzing, what we would tend to see is um, I'm going to take this data right here and I'm going to transpose it. So I'm going to transpose it in such a way now that um, on this axis, I'm going to have moment magnitude and on the y-axis I'm going to have um, just the raw number of um, points I guess uh, uh, for a particular instance. So what we might see is at some magnitude we're going to start seeing the points kind of start to stack. And we might have some gaps. We might even have some kind of weird stuff. But the, if you gather enough data and it's true, um, it's legitimate data and it's, um, there's no bias in it and it's randomly sampled, eventually you're going to start to see some kind of patterns develop. And so this is where we get the, the familiar term called the bell curve. So in other words, you can kind of see that it's making a shape that looks kind of like the bell curve that you guys are probably familiar with. Okay, so now 
if we take the total number and uh, divide this axis number by the total number, then what we get essentially is a probability, meaning that um, I'm going to erase that then, and I'm just going to write probability. So that's the, uh, the number divided by the total number. So um, in other words, if we take all of the area underneath this curve, it should sum up to equal 1 or 100%. Okay, so what this is telling us is, is a couple of things. That for this particular surface rupture length, that this magnitude right here is the most likely magnitude that, uh, that we would see with this fault surface rupture length according to the data. And so if this is a normal distribution, this would be the mean and it would also be the median. Okay, now um, we often refer to this also as the 50th percentile. So with this kind of bell curve that gives us a probability of some um, dependent variable, then we call this function right here we call this a cumulative, or I'm sorry, we call this a probability density function, or PDF, or sometimes you see it as um, like a little f of x. So uh, if it follows just a normal distribution, that's a very common distribution we see. And um, with that, we, we have a certain equation and, and rules that we can follow. Otherwise, um, sometimes other distributions might be more appropriate. So in the case of like earthquakes or a lot of different things from nature, for instance, um, what we tend to see is distributions that don't necessarily follow that bell curve when they're plotted linearly like we did, but sometimes um, data plots better like this. When you plot it linearly. So you might get a distribution function that peaks like this and then has a long tail. Okay, so if, if that were the case, then uh, we could transform that axis to say uh, this again was, surf, uh, or I'm sorry, this is mag moment magnitude now, and this is probability. So we could transform that maybe to the log of moment magnitude. or the natural log, and what we might get then is a bell curve. So if, um, if we transform the data on a log, or a natural log, or a square root scale, or something, we, but well, if we, if we transport on a natural log scale, we end up with um, a log normal probability distribution, which has its own rules and its own function. But you know, in, in very simplistic terms, all it is is, um, a normal distribution when you plot the logarithm or the natural logarithm of the data. Okay, um, one thing, by the way, to point out that um, in, in this particular instance, if you have log normal data, the mean is not equal to the median. And um, so you got to be careful of that. Okay. So now, here we are, we're back, we have a probability density function. It's given us prob of, you know, moment magnitude for some given surface rupture length. Now one thing that we might be interested in is um, if we start integrating at different points underneath this probability density function. 
So for a given uh, moment magnitude, say, we compute uh, the probability of being less than that um, given magnitude. So if we start integrating then this uh, probability function, we're going to end up with a, a function that's going to look something like this, where it's going to top out at a value of 1.0 because like we said the total area underneath the probability density function has uh, got to be equal to 100 percent or 1. So if we sum it all up at uh, very very high magnitudes we expect to get 1 on this um, integrated function. This integrated function has a special name and it's called a cumulative Uh, probability density function or sometimes we just call it the CDF or big F of X. Um, we also sometimes use uh, this Greek symbol to represent um, the cumulative probability density function. So the the probability or the the CDF is very useful because um, as engineers we often don't really care about what the probability is that a parameter equals something. We're more concerned about whether it exceeds it or doesn't exceed it. And so the CDF is what's going to help us with the issues of exceedance or non-exceedance. So why is this important? So let's go back to our original example now of surface rupture length versus moment magnitude. Let's try to recreate the dots that we had before. Something like that. Okay. And then um, let's recreate our line that we had through there. I think I had it as a red line. Okay. So here's our original data. Now let's say that um, our client, for whatever reason, is extremely concerned about um, a certain level earthquake or a certain magnitude earthquake. So this is now our magnitude of concern. Okay. So and let's say that our given fault uh, that we have in, in this particular site is going to have a surface rupture length equal to um, this value here. Okay. Now, um, if we were just using the best fit equation, we would look at that value and say, oh, well, the magnitude is far below the magnitude of concern. We're not worried about it move on. But if we consider the probability density function, uh, so again let's take this and, and pull it down here and transform it. So again here's uh, magnitude, here's our density function, and let's just say right here is our, uh, this corresponds to our magnitude of concern. So you can see from our peak, our mean and our median, if this was a normal distribution, you would see that we're well below the magnitude of concern. We wouldn't really worry about it. But if we consider the spread of the data, you can see that there is a likelihood, according to some of the data points, that we might actually be at or above the magnitude of concern. And because how do we know that? Well, because there's a little bit of area above the magnitude of concern that we're worried about. 
So I want to know as an engineer what that probability is that is equal to or greater than my magnitude of concern. So in order to do this, what I'm going to do is I need to know um, what the area is under that curve. So uh, this is where we're going to come up with like z values. You might recall that a z value is uh, simply equal to the um, uh, the actual value minus the mean value all divided by the standard deviation. So in, in this instance then um, M concern would go right there and uh, for my mean I would just put my mean magnitude and standard deviation is defined by the data, something that we calculate um, from the data itself. So we can get a z-score then um, for this actual uh, magnitude of concern. Then what we're going to do is we're going to plug that into our CDF function. But it's not, we're not just going to plug it right in because you've got to remember the CDF is going to give us the probability of non-exceedance. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute um, that the prob is going to equal 1 minus the cumulative density function of our z value. And that would give us the probability of exceeding this magnitude of concern. This is important because it's, it's acknowledging and dealing with the fact that we don't know the exact solution. We're guessing what it is based off the data. We're doing the best we can, but um, this is how we're going to harness statistics and probability theory to try to help us be better engineers and guide our decisions a little bit better. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other things that we need to discuss. Okay, yeah, yeah, there's one other thing. So in the equation with the Wells and Coppersmith, you guys are going to see us use um, what's called the T distribution. Okay, the T distribution is, um, it, it's like the, the normal distribution. Uh, but it deals with discrete data sets. So in other words, to use it, we need a couple things. We need to know um, the number of data points in our data set. And then, of course, depending on what we want, we need to know what the z-value is. Um, or if we want uh, given a z value, we um, or I'm sorry, or if we want to back calculate a z value, we need the probability from which we calculate the corresponding z value that would give us that. So uh, the Wells and Coppersmith data is going to use the t distribution. Now, if you want to use the t distribution in Excel. Um, I believe it is a function called tdist, or if you want to do the inverse uh, t distribution, I think it's tinv. So this is just the um, t distribution. So your input to this would be the um, z value and the number of samples you have and whether you want it cumulative or not. Um, the inverse function, the input would be your probability. Um, whoops, let's erase that. This is the inverse t distribution. And this would return uh, the Z score that corresponds to some probability of interest. So the input for the T inverse would be the number of data points in your sample 
and the um, probability of non-exceedance that you're interested in. So uh, this again would be the probability uh, if, if I have my bell curve this would be the area to the left of my uh, z value of interest and this area by the way is what we call alpha okay that's the probability of non-exceedance so if you go through the examples that um, I provided on the learning suite uh, website uh, it, it's under additional reading material and content but also if you go to just the homework problem I think it's number four on the homework assignment I have a link to the homework uh, to the handout as well it's uh, Travis Gerber's Wells and Coppersmith example he has some really nice examples of how to use the t-distribution with the Wells and Coppersmith data but hopefully this brief little tutorial gives you an idea of what we talk about when we say probability density functions, cumulative probability density functions, and why accounting for probability uh, and accounting for these statistics uh, can be useful in making engineering uh, decisions. So with that, thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.